Welcome to our talk, Confluence Multicloud Journey to Cilium, Pitfalls and Lessons Learned. Uh, this is Nimisha. My name is Alvaro. We both work at Confluent as software engineers in what's internally called the Con uh, QMES platform team. Today, we're going to talk about our migration to Cilium. We're going to start with giving a bit of background about Confluent um, and our usage of Cilium. We will talk about the migration process as such, um, about the issues we encountered along the way, and leave with our conclusion. To give some background, what does Confluent even do? So generally speaking, we offer a product related to data streaming and data stream processing. Um, a big part of that is Confluent Cloud, which is basically a managed version of all of these. This includes things like Kafka, Flink, and Connect. And this is available on AWS, Azure, and GCP in 91 regions total. Um, why does any, any of this matter? So the um, what this means is we have to manage a ton of infrastructure because we have to be not only in the same cloud but also in the same region as our customers because otherwise the economics of the whole thing just don't work out um, because all the clouds have data transfer fees. Um, yeah, and this entails we have a ton of infrastructure and specifically we have a ton of Kubernetes clusters um, because we have to have a presence in all of these. So why did we decide to use Cilium? So the primary motivation from our perspective were its security features, and most notably the transparent encryption. Um, we are a user of that. We are a very heavy user of the DNS-based network policy. We use them basically everywhere. The observability from Hubble helps us a lot. Um, and the other point is consistency. So as I said, um, we are using Kubernetes a lot. It helps us to kind of abstract the clouds away. Um, and prior to using Cilium, we basically had whatever the cloud natives, um, the cloud providers uh, native CNI offered. With Cilium, we basically have the possibility to offer uh, the same features everywhere. And lastly, we have a ton of infrastructure, and we're going to run into some interesting issues, as we will see later. So it's extremely reassuring to know that we have support and access to subject matter experts if we need this. Um, yeah, so how we enabled uh, Cilium across most of our fleet was by doing a migration. Uh, and as Alvaro said, it was migrating from the default CNI that these clusters were already using to use Cilium instead. Uh, and these are production clusters serving live traffic, and you know they have stateful uh, workloads on them. Um, so, and we are trying to replace the CNI, which is a very low-level component and maybe can be risky. So the simplest and cleanest way we thought to do this was by bringing up new nodes with the new CNI, which is Cilium, instead of uh, you know, changing something on the existing nodes. So let's look at this in a little more detail, starting with AWS. Uh, so if you uh, create an EKS cluster, you get the AWS VPC CNI installed by default, and it deploys this AWS node daemon set uh, on all the nodes. And the first step of the migration was that we patched this uh, daemon set to have an affinity such that it doesn't run on nodes having the CNI equals Cilium label. So it runs on all nodes except those having the label. And then we just bring up new nodes having that CNI equals Cilium label along with the no execute taint. Uh, this node remains not ready until Cilium is done configuring it. And uh, this is so that workloads don't get scheduled on it uh, until then. And then we just install Cilium. Uh, this time to the Cilium agent, we say uh, we give it the affinity that it should be scheduled only on the CNI equals Cilium nodes. Uh, and after that, it's just a matter of migrating our application pods to those nodes. And we do this by coordinating the old nodes and evicting the pods one by one. So one thing to note at this point, uh, the cluster is in a mixed state where some nodes are being managed by Cilium, but some by AWS. And this still works in terms of routing and network connectivity, because at the end of the day, they are both using uh, native routing. Uh, after that, uh, at the end of the migration, we just delete the old nodes, and then uh, eventually the VPC CNI from the cluster. At this point, CNI is, uh, sorry, Cilium is the exclusive uh, CNI in the cluster. Um, on GCP, uh, our clusters use GKE data plane v1. Uh, it's worth mentioning that GK data plane v2 clusters actually do imp is implemented uh, using Cilium under the hood. Um, so the migration on GCP for us was very similar uh, as AWS, with one difference, which is that the default GKE CNI is always present on the nodes. So it cannot really be uninstalled. And the way Cilium then takes over is by becoming the exclusive CNI. There's a Helm value for that. 
um, and it takes over the etc CNI net D directory basically. Uh, another caveat here was that uh, on GKE, we inherit this net D daemon set. Uh, it comes with certain features of GKE, such as workload identity, et cetera, and uh, it implements some networking features and can sometimes conflict with Cilium, as we'll see in a little bit. On Azure, there is a multi-step uh, kind of complex migration path, but it is officially supported. Uh, so you start out in the Azure CNI or KubeNet uh, mode, and then you go to Azure CNI overlay, uh, then to Azure CNI powered by Cilium, and then optionally to Cilium Enterprise from the Azure Marketplace. Uh, two things here, at the end of this migration, you will always end up with Cilium in overlay mode because you have to go through this overlay step. And the other thing is that uh, in this other step, uh, Azure CNI powered by Cilium, Cilium is not really configurable. So if you do want to configure it, uh, the Helm values, you have to go to the enterprise. Um, and at Confluent, we didn't end up actually implementing this path because it involves multiple node replacements and is a bit complex, but we do install Cilium on new Azure clusters by default. Cool. Okay, let's get to the fun st stuff, namely the issues we encountered along the way. So the first one I'm going to talk about is specific to AWS and to reverse path filtering. So in order to understand this, you have to have some basic understanding on how networking in AWS works, specifically when using an internet gateway. So basically, the instance gets a network interface attached, and this network interface has both a private and a public IP address. And then the instance itself, it only sees the private IP address and uses that to uh, reach the internet gateway, which then looks up the public IP um, and uses that to actually send the traffic off to the internet. And Cilium's job, of course, is to give every port its own IP address. So what it does is it simply adds additional IP addresses to this existing network interface. That works great. The problem, however, is that these network interfaces have a limit in terms of how many IP addresses can be allocated. So at some point, it has to add a second interface and then allocate more IP addresses on the second interface. But all these ports are, of course, supposed to be able to reach the internet. So in order to make that happen, um, there are some rules that basically specify that all traffic that has a destination outside of the VPC of this cluster um, goes out of the primary interface um, and gets masqueraded, which then enables internet connectivity for all of the pods. Which works great um, until you try to reach a pod from a peered VPC. Um, so what happens in that case is that the traffic, if it hits a pod that's on, that has its IP address on a secondary interface, um, it will go into the secondary interface, but then the routing rules on the node, they specify that the response has to go out of the primary interface um, because the destination is outside of the VPC of the Kubernetes cluster. And the problem with that, in turn, is that this doesn't actually work because Linux has this thing called the reverse path filter, and it basically uh, has some rules that specify that if the response to a package would go out of a different interface, then it initially came in, then it will just get dropped. So this doesn't work. And even if you disable the reverse path filter in Linux, um, AWS itself has a similar check, where they validate that the source IP address of a package is actually um, associated to the interface the package is leaving from, which wouldn't be the case here. So all of this just doesn't work. Um, as a workaround, we ended up using a node port service. Um, and basically have the uh, workload in the peer VPC, look up the node port um, and the IP address of the node, and then use the tool to, to reach this workload. Generally speaking, this works just fine, but obviously it's more complicated and has the drawback that the health signal gets diluted from the outside perspective because the node becomes one endpoint no matter how many pods are on it. So if, for example, the node has two pods, one of which has a problem, doesn't accept any connections, the other one is just fine. The way this looks from the outside is that there's a 50% error rate trying to establish a connection to this node. Um, and the outside, from the outside, it's not possible to differentiate um, one pod from the other. Okay, uh, let's jump right into our next issue. This is on GCP this time. Uh, so we have clusters where we use uh, Cilium FQDN-based policies. Um, so basically, uh, we use a default deny egress policy where we uh, allow traffic only to internal domains outside of the cluster, but all traffic within the cluster is allowed, including to kubeDNS. Uh, and what we noticed was that this, was br this policy was breaking all DNS within the cluster. Um, so, uh, yeah, packets were reaching the kubeDNS pods but not coming back. 
And uh, we used Hubble to observe uh, in more detail what the flows looked like. And this showed a strange thing, which is that uh, packets on the cube DNS pod side were not just getting denied by the policy. They were simply getting dropped or disappearing somewhere. Um, the way Cilium implements the FQDN-based policies uh, is by deploying a DNS proxy to all nodes. So this proxy essentially uh, intercepts all egress traffic from pods uh, when a DNS request is sent, and then uh, records the IPs that, it, that are uh, received in response and stores this in a cache on the node. This is how Cilium knows uh, to restrict traffic to certain domains versus not. Uh, and there's a separate policy uh, for what traffic can be intercepted by this DNS proxy, the part I've highlighted. So in our case, we uh, allow it to intercept all DNS traffic. And uh, we noticed that when we removed this section from the policy, DNS was working again. Uh, so which led us to conclude that DNS breaks only when intercepted by Cilium's DNS proxy. After this, uh, our friends at Isoelent actually helped us get to the bottom of what was happening. Uh, on a good cluster versus a bad cluster setup, the, the only difference that we found was on a node, a bad cluster node had this uh, sysctl setting called source valid mark set to one, versus a good one didn't. Um, so what is this setting anyway? Um, so it is a Linux networking configuration setting. Uh, it's a source and also a source address validation mechanism for the packet. Uh, essentially, whenever this is enabled on the kernel, the kernel performs additional checks based on the source IP address of a packet and also looks at some uh, marks in the packet header to determine if this is being asymmetrically routed or not. So if this is set, asymmetric routing scenarios are completely disabled. And whenever traffic was going through the Cilium DNS proxy, the kernel was considering these DNS packets invalid and just dropping them. Um, so we set this value to zero manually on a node just to check, and voila, DNS actually started working with the original policy completely unchanged until it was getting set again by something else in the pr uh, cluster. So uh, we had to figure out which process in the cluster is continually setting this to one. And uh, Tetragon and Falco are actually the perfect tools to discover something like this. Since we already had Falco deployed on our clusters, we ended up putting a, a Falco policy in there to, say, to log whenever a process was changing the value of this setting. And it turned out to be GKE's NetD process. Uh, remember earlier how I said NetD sometimes interferes with Cilium? Uh, you can see how it's setting the source valid mark here. So finally, this was traced to a GKE feature node as internode visibility. And we just ended up disabling that in favor of uh, Cilium FQDN-based policies. Uh, this is also suggested as a roadmap item for Cilium to monitor and warn on whenever the value of this setting is uh, not what it, it expects. Oops. OK, the second issue I'm going to talk about is specific to H uh, GCP and to pod IPs over there. So as Nimisha mentioned initially, the basic idea as to how we do this migration is that we let new nodes come up with Cilium and not come up with whatever is the default on the respective cloud. The problem, however, on GCP specifically is that this is not possible because GCP has a CNI that's embedded in the node image, so when a node comes up, it always already has a CNI. And what this can lead to is this situation here. So what you can see, there are two pods. Both of them have the same IP address, and one of them will not have working network connectivity. Um, why does this happen? So because the nodes have the CNI embedded on the image, they can just become ready um, on startup before the Cilium agent uh, is actually scheduled and running there, which means the GCP CNI will allocate an IP address, Cilium will not know anything about it, and it will happily hand out the same address, IP address again to another pod, um, which then will not have a working network uh, connectivity. This cannot happen on any of the other clouds because they don't have this default CNI that's always there, and this implicitly prevents any pod that doesn't have host networking from running before Cilium is up. Um, and the obvious solution to that seems to be to use a Tain to basically prevent any pod from running before the Cilium agent does. And for the most part, that actually works well. The problem is that we have a number of daemon sets related to things like metric and log collection and security, and these daemon sets have to run on all nodes no matter what. And in order to make that happen, we configure them to tolerate all taints. 
The reason for that is that Kubernetes basically has two ways on, as to how you can tolerate taint. You can either say you tolerate absolutely everything, or you enumerate every single taint you want to tolerate. Um, and the problem is, as I said, we have a ton of clusters with very diverse configuration. So basically maintaining a list that has all the taints that might occur anywhere is not realistic for us. So instead, we just tolerate all of them. The ideal case of we tolerate everything except this one is unfortunately something that the Kubernetes API does not support. Um, so on top of a taint, what we have is a controller that deletes pods that got their IP address before the Cilium agent was up to work around this issue. Let's talk a little bit about misconfiguration as well. Uh, issues arising out of misconfiguration are more common than you might think. Uh, as of October, Cilium had over 800 configurable Helm values. And these values can vary a lot based on your networking setup, your cloud provider, as well as if you want to enable certain features or not. Uh, just to give a small example of this, uh, we were using Hubble metrics flows to world to monitor all the traffic going out from pods. Uh, and we noticed that the cardinality of this metric was just exploding. And the reason was that the metrics associated with deleted pods uh, were not getting cleaned up. So we had to kind of dig through some uh, issues and uh, PRs in the Cilium repo. And we discovered that there is a, a solution implemented for this, but you can only uh, avail it if you s set a certain set of labels on that metric. Um, so enabling that label uh, started, uh, you know, the, the cleanup mechanism started kicking in after that. Um, let's take a small detour to talk about transparent encryption. Uh, so understandably, there's a network overhead associated with encrypting all pod-to-pod -pod traffic. Uh, and in our case, we used WireGuard to encrypt traffic, and we ran some bet, uh, network benchmark tests on all three clouds to show the performance. Uh, the left bar on all clouds is the native routing uh, performance with, uh, for TCP stream, and the right side is Cilium with WireGuard. Uh, and the performance drops, drop occurs because WireGuard has to establish an encapsulation tunnel over uh, UDP to en uh, actually encrypt these packets. Uh, and in one of our clusters, we noticed that uh, the network throughput was way higher than we uh, were used to. So that led us to suspect that encryption wasn't actually happening. Uh, a TCP dump on the node actually confirmed this because no packets were flowing through this WireGuard interface, which they generally would if encryption was actually happening. And this was traced down to an incorrect Helm value for the native routing CIDR. Uh, so what happened was our test pods had IPs outside of this CIDR. Um, and what the CIDR should be set to is all the uh, pod IP address space uh, possible. And if the IP is outside the CIDR, Cilium will snat this traffic as the node traffic. Uh, so this actually can bypass encryption and more importantly, network policy enforcement too. OK, the last issue I'm going to talk about is specific to Azure to make the round with all three clouds um, and specific to Azure host ports. Uh, so what happened? We, at some point, upgraded a number of uh, our Kubernetes clusters so that they had a new version and all nodes got replaced along the way. And we noticed that the number of workloads that make themselves available externally through a host port were not actually reachable. And this was not really deterministic in that it happened for some, but not all of them. And we also relatively quickly noticed that just restarting the Cilium agent um, resolves the issue. But at this point, we didn't know why it was happening. Um, we eventually run into this. Um, what you can see here is the IP tables pre-routing chain. Um, it's the same in both of the screenshots. The only thing that's different is the order of the rules in there. So in the top screenshot, there's first the Cube Services rules, then the Cilium one. In the bottom one, it's the other way around. And the bottom one is from a node where the connectivity works just fine, the top one from one where it doesn't. Um, so somehow, this, this gets mingled up and is not deterministic. But why is this in turn happening? Um, so what eventually the folks at Isovaliant actually figured out is that if in Azure AKS you have pods in the cube system namespace, they get this Kubernetes service host environment variable injected. And this environment variable is used by the various SDKs um, that try to reach a Kubernetes API server to figure out the address to use for that. Um, and what you can see here on the two screenshots on the side is on the top, um, there is the result of printing this variable from a pod in AKS in the kube system namespace. And on the bottom, it's when doing the same, 
um, on any other pod in a different namespace or on a different cloud. Um, in the bottom one, which is the default, what you can see is an IP address. This IP address is a virtual IP that's um, managed by QPoxy, um, and this is basically the explanation as to why all of this is happening. So the Cilium agent needs to reach the Kubernetes API server to fetch its configuration. And if it's using the default approach of using the QPoxy virtual IP, then it's impossible for the Cilium agent to come up before QPoxy did come up. Um, and both QPoxy and Cilium prepend their rules, so whoever starts last kind of wins. Um, and Azure introduced this injection of this environment variable and basically short-circuiting uh, QPoxy, presumably as a reliability measure. Um, but ironically, it does the opposite in this particular scenario in that it makes the startup indeterministic um, and allows Cilium to start first, in which case certain things will not work. Um, the workaround we ended up with is to just block the startup um, of Cilium until the QPoxy rules we need exist and yeah, ensure the ordering again. Uh, to wrap things up, despite all the issues we talked about just now, we actually successfully migrated several of our production clusters to use Cilium. And Cilium is becoming our go-to tool for securing cluster workloads. Uh, despite all the testing we do uh, in pre-production environments, networking uh, in, in a high-churn environment can be really difficult. Uh, so uh, we actually discovered some issues only in production. Uh, but what makes things really easy for us as end users is that Cilium has a great community and some amazing tooling. Uh, so that makes it super accessible and welcoming for us. So thank you to the community. Uh, and thank you to Isovalent. And also thank you all for attending the talk. Uh, if you want more clarity on anything we talked about, you can find us after the talk. Um, we'll be around uh, for the rest of the conference. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> I think we have like one and a half minutes for questions. What? OK. Oh, we didn't realize there was time allocated for questions, but it seems like there is. So does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? It was probably uh, too much at once. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you mentioned on Azure that you cannot configure uh, the standard Cilium offering, and you have to upgrade to Enterprise. Did you find that as a complete blocker to trying or using uh, their, their free version of Cilium? Uh, we do use Enterprise on our, all, all our clusters, so it wasn't a blocker because of that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, I think for now, cannot configure the Cilium Helm value specifically uh, on using the open source version. OK, thank you. Hello. Here. Cool. Uh, we'll wrap up then. Thanks. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> hey. So when you had split nodes for a while that had both uh, an old CNI and a Cilium, did you disable network policy enforcement, or were you able to work with network policy enforcement only working on some nodes? Uh, yeah, we did not have network policies at that time. So I think network policies would not work reliably in that state. 